This is Viterbi Voices. Coming to you from the University of Southern California Viterbi School of Engineering. We're here to give you the inside scoop about research, classes, student life, and so much more. All of these shared from our students, faculty, and other members of our USC community. Welcome back to the Turby Voices. As usual, I am one of your hosts. My name is Paul Ledesma, Director of Undergraduate Admission here at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. And hi, everyone. My name is Emily, and I am a senior studying biomedical engineering. Emily, Emily, where have the days gone? We are getting close to the end of September. It's like officially fall or autumn. Yeah. It's, it's actually crazy. Yeah. I'm kind of excited, though, to get some cooler temps on campus. I've noticed that this week in particular, like I've been waking up and it's been foggy and I'm like, Ooh, this is nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, I might need to wear a sweatshirt when I walk my daughter to school. And it's like, Ooh, this is nice. Is it going to stay? It's still getting warmer (laughs) in the afternoon. Don't get me wrong. Uh, But it's still like, it is super nice to kind of like adjust uh, to some new temperatures. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. now now I'm feeling like I need new wardrobe changes. So I've been doing some online shopping lately. I'm like, (laughs) Oh no, what what do I need? What do I need now? (laughs) Of course, oh, never, awesome. never needing any of it, but I've just been obsessed with uh, buying new clothes for the last like year or so. Mm-hmm. But yes, it's fall. It's crazy. It is. We're in the, we're in the thick of it for all of our listeners out there. As you know, if you're mostly high school students, we also have some college students from other universities that are thinking about transferring. I hope that your fall terms are going rather, rather well. Um, you're, you're, you're probably in it now. I've got assignments, you're doing work. Mm-hmm. And if you're still listening to us, Hey, thanks for being here. Today, we have a, a really good, and it is another one of our uh, alumni conversations. And uh, warning, spoiler alert, I don't know what, what you want to call it. <laughs> this is a long one. It is a super long episode. So long, in fact, that Emily has done a lot of work here to break it up into two episodes because we just kept talking and talking and talking. This is with our alumna, Kristen Sayuni. Kristen is a graduate of the Daniel J. Epstein Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering, and she has gone on to do a number of different things, not to mention just a number of different education, all the way through her PhD in industrial engineering and has worked at, uh, help me if you can remember this, we recorded this a while ago, she worked at Disney World, like, Disney. In, yeah, and in, in like the, her Imaginary and stuff like that. She's worked at UPS. Mm -hmm. She's worked at a couple different places. And and more recently, her her kind of her current career for a long time period is with Apple and doing Mm -hmm. a lot of really cool um, kind of project supply chain stuff. And and it's just it's it's an awesome stuff. Kristen is a gem. I've known Kristen for an incredibly long time, uh, going back probably about 20 years at this point, nearly 20 years uh, since she was a student studying industrial systems engineering. She was one of our first student ambassadors, uh, which we talk a little bit about in this episode. And uh, that, that's, of course, what Emily is and, uh, and a lot of her peers as student ambassadors and kind of helping to promote the school and talk about their lives. And, and Kristen Sayuni was one of our very first ones we ever brought on board to that team. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I just love her. And I hope that you will as well, because this conversation it, although long, uh, to me, it doesn't seem long because it was just, it just kind of kept going, which is why I never like yeah. cut her off. We just, we kind of kept talking and kept talking, kept talking about cool stuff. Um, this first episode gets all the way up until her time at Apple. So it's not going to include the Apple stuff, but part two next week will, um, is there anything, Emily, that you wanted to shout out, uh, for people to listen to at this particular episode or that you remember? I mean, one thing that really stuck out to me was like Kristen's motto in life. And it was just like, Mm. give me a challenge. Like, I just want to be like, do something hard. And I want to like, I don't know. I think that's really cool because I think sometimes like you don't see that all the time. Like someone who's like looking for the challenge, looking to like make, I don't know, make a difference. And I I thought that was really cool. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, here is part one of Kristen Sayuni. Uh, I can't wait for you to hear this episode. Stick around for the back end and we'll give you a couple of updates of what's happening uh, on campus at this time of year and also with the admission process. And then also keep in mind, there's a part two coming next week with a whole other part of this conversation. You're here. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing great. It is so good to see you. Yeah, likewise. I um, I got the references links that you sent. Um, and so I listened to a bit of Jason's and all these podcasts and I was like instantly transported to 20 years ago. It was awesome. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure we talked about you in Jason's podcast and Jason's episode. I did. I heard the shout out. I was like, I'm surprised that guy remembers me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so good to see you. Yes. I was thinking of just like a few minutes ago, like I was like, okay, we're going to pull up Kristen. And I'm like, I really hope she listened to Jason's episode because we talked about her and we're start, we're going to start completing the, uh, that first class of student ambassadors. We have to get through like almost everybody. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I heard it. And, um, it was so funny because it was a while back when he was in Australia. I think he's it's coming like back, ago. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I just saw, I just saw he's coming back now. He's coming back to the U S which I hope in, I think in the LA area, which is good. Yeah. So excited. Where, where are you these days? Are you up North or are you in LA? Where, where are you? Yeah. So I work for Apple. So I'm up in the Bay area. Um, mm -hmm. But the cool thing about working remotely for the last year and a half is I can just <laughs> head down. So my whole family's in LA. So I'll go there and work for like a week at a time every now and again. Um, so That's right great. now I'm at home up North. Um, That's but great. I think I'll be down in a couple of weeks. So yeah. Well, cool. Well, cool. Awesome. Yeah. It's so good to see you. You look great. And from, the, you. from, your, from your LinkedIn <laughs> profile, you have been nothing but successful since, since last we saw each other. I think the last time we saw each other was like when you graduated. So like probably we're, we're, we're approaching 20 years here. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been such an adventure to look back. I don't feel that old, but especially when I talk to, uh, like I have an intern now who, you know, was uh -huh. born in like 2000 and I was like, Jesus uh -huh. Christ, like they don't know half of my references. So <laughs> like I was telling them the other day, it was like, you know, back in my day, you used to be able to walk on an airplane without a ticket. And like, they don't know those things. Like that's just totally, <laughs> I, I trust you're old enough. You remember that that used to be a thing, right? It is definitely a thing. It, it, my, my favorite part is I was laughing at uh, back in my day when if you ever start using that term, that's how Ew. you know you're old. And it, and meanwhile, me, you know, I, I, I keep working with students that are the same age, right? And I just keep getting older and older and older. So like, the, the references just keep getting lost at a certain point. It was probably about <laughs> 10 years ago, I just gave up and stopped talking about things. And just be like, every once in a while, I'd be like, so a uh, real quick question. Have you seen <laughs> this movie? And then it used to, then for a while there was really disappointing. Like, no, I don't know what that is. Now we're at a point where it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, my dad showed that to me because that's one of his Christ. favorite movies. And so I'm like, <laughs> cool, that's me. Uh, that's me. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I want to I want to catch up and I want to I want to make totally. sure that our listeners actually know a little bit about you. Uh, so, Kristen, uh, why don't you tell everybody? Um, let, let's let's start at the beginning, shall we? Where <laughs> where did you grow up? Where did you, where did you go to high school? Tell me about high school version of Kristen. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in the L.A. area, uh, just east of Pasadena in this little cute town called Arcadia. Um, uh -huh. if you've never seen a peacock in real life, just come to Arcadia. That's where they all live. They're they're They just wander the neighborhoods. It's really our claim to fame. Um, and I went to a Catholic all girls high school. Uh, it was in my family, my whole, like my whole, every woman in my family has gone there. Um, and it was really interesting going from this really small all girls school where there were like 92 people in my graduating class to USC and like, Oh, this, I didn't know the rules of football. And all of a sudden I had to learn them within like you know, three days of moving to campus. Um, so, and then being in this huge environment was super cool. Um, I didn't think I would stay so close to home, but uh, going to us, I, and I knew I wanted to check out engineering. I really wasn't sure what, what branch, but going through and meeting, um, uh, you weren't in the role at the time, but Matt Opre was in, and Dean yeah. Yates. And, and just you, meeting. You, your, your admission to USC predates me because you, yeah. you start, I think, so you started what 98? I was fall 99 is when fall I joined. 99. 
Yeah. Um, and so there was another woman there. Tomiko, I want to say what's her name. Tomiko um, was there. And I just thought that they were lovely. Um, every school that I went to, like, it just felt very welcoming, very connecting, very easygoing. Um, and that Trojan family that we talked about, just like, I felt it immediately. And so mm. it, it just walking onto campus, just like, yeah, this kind of, this could be home for a while. Uh, um, cool. So, yeah, so I went there not knowing what I was going to do uh, and had a great time. Did you know that you wanted to stay close to home? I, I really didn't want to. Uh, I wanted to go back to get out. Yeah, I wanted to go. I had my heart set on going to Boston, um, it, which is funny because now I get cold when it's like 75. Um, <laughs> but I, I just really wanted to go and venture out. Um, I had lived in the L.A. area my whole life, um, but it just, it felt right. It felt like the right place. And I think that that's something as I've made lots of transitions throughout life, it's all about how it, like fit and how it feels. Um, and trusting my gut of like, yeah, this is, this is going to be a good place for me. Uh, that's great. That's yeah. really cool. So you came in fall 99. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what's, what's actually interesting, because of course I, I need to make it about me for a minute. Of course I didn't work in admission, <laughs> but at that time, that summer I was a student and I worked in orientation. I think you were at my orientation. I remember. And I was, I was in an orientation advisor at the time, yeah. which is like a glorified student position. Like, you know, we're like the red polos and like, yeah. we're like basically camp counselors for you guys as you go through summer. <laughs> and so uh, do, do you remember orientation? I, I have fond memories of that summer for a number of reasons. I remember it. And I remember staying in a dorm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Was it? the one that's like by EVK. Um, I don't know which one is on top of it. That's when I stayed at. Um, yeah. And then I was so relieved when I got my, my little welcome packet and I found out I was staying in an apartment because I was like, yeah, I don't <laughs> think I can do that. <laughs> I can't do that shower situation. You need so you need a little more privacy. You needed a little more uh, uh, localization of your, of trying your, to wear flip-flops every day to the showers. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a thing. Um, so I do feel like I missed out on like that part of college life, uh, but the, you know, the stereotypical but, but dorm, okay. dorm life. <laughs> yeah. The dorm life. But I think I did but, all right. <laughs> you know, I always tell, I always tell families like, you know, you get the same experience because like, you're still living with people you don't know. You're still kind of adjusting and you're still kind of like creating these new boundaries and letting go of other boundaries. It just happens yeah. on different scales. And so it's a yeah. question of what everybody wants. Yeah. Well, and having a, a living room and a kitchen was just clutch. Like it was so... Yeah. And it was convenient. And there were so there were fewer of us and we were all mingled together, like the guys and the girls. And it, we, we had a great time. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, I do remember orientation. It was uh, so wild to think back of like the yeah. things in life you remember. And then the rest of it is a blur. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was a super fun time. I mean, for us, when we were doing that as, as orientation advisors, it was like this really, we ended up being like a close knit group of people. Uh, one of those guys, a close friend of mine became God godfather to my daughter. Wow. Um, and we still keep in touch as a group, you know, relatively, there's like 24, 25 of us, That's um, awesome. you know, I've been in a few of their weddings and like, you know, like it's just, it's a, it's a really tight knit group. Cause we basically live together 24 yeah. seven for all of summer for the good and the bad. I'm going to tell you there, there's drama filled <laughs> moments looking back on it that were hilarious. No doubt. <laughs> Um, but it's, uh, it's a cool experience and it's always fun because there was, there were students that we ended up connecting with like incoming first year students like yourself that still maintained relationships throughout the years and got to know them. And it comes up every once in a while, like, Oh, Hey, did you know you were my orientation advisor? Or I remember seeing your orientation. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my God. Wow. That's so, that's so crazy. It's, it's a different world now that that role yeah. still exists, but it's a, it's a very different role. It's like so just come- the tiniest taste of what it would be like to be recognizable in yeah. real life. Right. Like yeah. random people will come up to me like, I know you from so-and-so is like, Oh, I hope I, I hope I was well behaved. <laughs> right. <laughs> because Isn't I have no scary? idea who you are. Right. Yeah. Um, it's scary. Yeah. It's, it's scary. Um, okay. So you come from Arcadia, like the vast yeah. distant land of Arcadia and a and, whopping and... 22 miles. Yeah. I think it's something. Is it 22 miles? Really? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So anyway. you, you, you go, you come from Arcadia and you end up coming to USC. Did you mm-hmm. always know you wanted to be an engineer? Was that always the plan regardless of where you went to school? Um, uh, 
I, yeah, I wanted to check it out. And the reason is, um, I gotta give a shout out. I had this science teacher at our little school and everybody knows her. Her name's Aliki Flagan. And she is just- which, which school do you go to? Are you refusing to the name? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Ramona Convent in Alhambra, uh, which it. is just like down the road. Um, but the science teacher was like, just one of those gems of a person, like salt mm. of the earth people. And she was just so motivating. And she had this like, she really cared about her job. You know, some people like it's a calling and mm -hmm. others just are there to mm -hmm. you know, do whatever. She was so good at it. And oh. um, she was just very inspirational. And, um, you know, it's, it's tricky because going growing up, like until that age of high school, I felt like the only profession I had a lot of experience around was teachers. Like I didn't know what yeah. an engineer was or what they do. Yeah. My right. uncle was one, and but I didn't know about his day to day. Um, and so she was just like, you should really check it out. Like you, you, math is easy for you. Science is easy for you. Like it just makes sense. And I was like, hmm, okay, I'll check it out. Uh, <laughs> so I what did is? having Let's no go. idea. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll roll the dice and see what happens. <laughs> and so I like every school I applied to, um, you know, I was just like, I would read the art, I think 22 majors, like mm, I definitely don't want to do that one. Um, and so what I, I think I see had it at the time, it was like an undeclared engineering. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, well, that feels better. Like, let me go get the smorgasbord. Like, like, let me get the yeah. platter of like a lecture every week of like what I want to do. And then, yeah. and then I'll pick one. Um, right. So I, I thought that that was actually a super compelling reason to go to USC as opposed to some of these other schools, even that, um, they didn't have that. So I went in totally open-minded about it. Um, and if I didn't like it, like, well, I knew Marshall was a good option. Um, right. You had other like, things just, that, yeah. You can always step downstream, right? You yeah, can always totally. like work your way in, and find anything at USC because anything's there. And let's give engineering the option. And that's yeah. great. Yeah. So that's how we, I started out. That's cool. Because I spend so much of my time these days letting people know, for lack of a better term, to kind of like uh, con condense your, your journey is uh, giving yourself the flexibility to, to find success is just let's yeah. let, let's start with engineering because if that's an option we don't want to eliminate that option and we can always work our way to other things but you don't want to do the reverse because the reverse like you're behind and it's just you're playing catch up and that's not a very conducive environment so yeah i'm glad that worked out for you because yeah uh, you you find your way into industrial and systems engineering that's as right you agree, correct yeah that's uh, right. how did you choose that after doing the uh, the poo poo platter as you as you, <laughs> as you as you as you mentioned it I think I figured out in my first first year that I wanted to do it. It was a really small major, um, it, and industrial engineering is unfortunately like they need some brand makeover because nobody really knows it's a horrible what they name, do. right? It, it just it sounds dirty, and if you know anything yeah. about me, I don't like to be dirty. Like I, I, <laughs> I never want grease under my fingernails, right? So I was not going to be mechanical, um, which is hilarious because now I work in mechanical design and, and manufacturing, but. Um, it, the way somebody explained it to me is like it was a combination of engineering applied to business and mm -hmm. the major had it set up so that you could go you, I think we had to take a, a handful of classes through Marshall um and so I was like well that sounds that sounds like a like a cool hybrid you could tell I'm, yeah. I'm not a decisive person like I'm all about having lots of options <laughs> so um so that appealed to me and then I met a couple of professors and a couple of students who were in it and I was like well let me check that out um and it, I think it had the fewest number of labs and yeah, I didn't love like sitting in a chemistry lab or whatever it is, all the other majors do. Uh, so, so I, so I went to do that and, and I, it was my freshman year and, uh, I went to the, the career admissions fair thing and I ended up getting an internship with an industrial engineering department, um, the summer after my freshman year when I hadn't, I don't think I'd even taken any of the classes. And so I got like this real world experience and I was like, Hey, this, this is kind of cool. Like, I, I think I'm going to, yeah. yeah, I'm going to stick with this. Yeah. Um, and then my second year, I really got into the classes and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll stick I like this. Yeah. That's totally it. Like I'm not one of these people with like a master vision of like in 25 years, I'm, I'm like, I'm figuring out the next six months and then, and then I'll see what feels right. So, uh, Absolutely. I took it sort of one semester at a time and everything, you know, kind of look back and like, that's oh, pretty good. Let's do it again. So sweet. Yeah. Where did you intern? Uh, you, because you have a few different internships under your belt while you're in, in college. Yeah. In so, different industries too. Yeah. I interned at UPS, uh, which is like the grandfather of, of industrial engineering actually. And they had a handful of USC IEs there also who were a couple of years ahead of me. Mm. Um, so like Tyson Hudson and Melissa Price and, um, 
and there were a couple of full-time people there who were getting their masters at USC. So I felt like very safe in this, in this family, yeah. in this nest. Um, so I went there and I worked on, um, if you've ever looked at a UPS, uh, box now or, or a package label, it has like some routing information for how they yeah. pre-sort the yeah. stuff. And so we were the team that implemented that LA wow. got to be the first, um, you know, the pilot city for UPS to do this like automated dispatching system. Uh, and so I got to work on that as like 19 years old. And I was like, huh, this is so cool. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so I, I did UPS for right after my freshman year. And then after my sophomore year, I had an offer from a different company and it didn't work out. So I quick called up UPS. And I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm coming back. Right. They're like, yeah. So can I, great. can I automate <laughs> automatically route myself back to you guys? Yeah. Like, can I just <laughs> boomerang this? So, um, I ended up working there, uh, after every single summer, even after my senior year, after I graduated, before I went to grad school. So I had in total four, like three month internships. And then I worked there part-time during the year as a senior. Um, money was good. It was super convenient. I liked the people. Um, and um, so it, so there are lots of trade-offs to that approach. Um, I think I didn't get enough poo-poo platter experience of in, like in what industry. Yeah, experience you didn't, you didn't have that same, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so looking back, like I think, you know, that it would have been good to try something else. Yeah. Um, but I definitely had that cumulative effect and got to see um, think like how projects change over several years at a company, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. I thought was super helpful now. That's awesome. Now, yeah. when, when you receive your UPS packages to this day, do you, do you have this sense of like, Hey buddy, like, like, like you're looking at those QR codes and, and, and routing uh, information is like, Hey, that, that, do you, is it like looking in a mirror or, or is it like PTSD? Like, how do you feel about UPS in general? I have a kinship with those guys. Like, I think they're the hardest working people on the, the package car drivers to drive like the big brown checks. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, I think the statute of limitations has passed. Uh, so I can admit that I still kept a uniform because um, I got to do like ride alongs and stuff. Right. So I have it. Um, and, and it makes it, like, I, even every time I see a, a package car on the road, I feel just like, oh, I like those guys, but there are like these funny references I'll toss out. So uh, when I move one of my many moves, I shipped a whole bunch of stuff and I shipped at UPS because customers on my, that was my loyalty. You have legions. Um, yeah. 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 And I couldn't figure out what day they were going to deliver it. It was downtown Chicago. So it's like pretty, you know, inconvenient to mm -hmm. <laughs> do mm -hmm. a huge delivery there. Um, and so I called her, I called a friend who I knew who worked there. I got the phone number to the local person. So I didn't have to go through the automated dispatch. Um, and she was like, yeah, I think I, let me look for it. And she said, well, there's a lot of packages. I was like, oh, don't worry. It'll fit in the rear wheel well of a, of a P10, which to you probably means nothing. But she, I knew like exactly like what size truck was going to come deliver it, like where they were going to put it in the car. And she was just like, are you an in I was like, yeah, insider. <laughs> so um you're like, that I run a really uh, UPS fangirl.com. I, I, I run an insider <laughs> blog uh, now, now, now curating the Reddit threads uh, totally. uh, on, on, on the brown shorts. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would not be surprised if that's a thing. I think that, that there is, I'm sure there's like a, I'm sure there, there's something for everybody it, online. Yeah. Right? Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know. I'm not going to Google that because I'm sure it's <laughs> creepy. <laughs> So no, I would not be on the creepy Reddit thread, but no, no, no. But I, yeah. I bet that kind of blew her mind. Like, who am I talking to? Like, what is going on? Yeah, this yeah. is insider. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you went uh, from USC into grad school, where you went and did a master's mm -hmm. and a doctorate at, at Northwestern, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, while I was at USC, I uh, Professor Dasuki, who I think is still there, yeah. uh, Majid Dasuki is the chair of the Industrial Systems and the Daniel J. Epstein Department of the Industrial Daniel Systems J. Engineering. Epstein. Yeah. Um, he was just really lovely. Um, just a lovely mentor for me. And, mm -hmm. um, he let me do some research with his team uh, while I was an undergrad. And so I talked to him, um, you know, coming up on graduation, I interviewed for consulting firms. I'd interview, you know, I knew UPS was an option. Um, and I was like, but I don't feel like I want to do that grown up thing yet. Um, and if, you know, he's like, well, you're pretty good at school. Why don't you go to grad school? And I was like, mm -hmm yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, I've been in school for a while. I, I was trying to figure it out. And he said, well, apply for this fellowship. Um, mm -hmm. and it was through the national science foundation and like whiz bang, boom, I got it. 
Um, I think they gave it to three IEs in the country that year. Um, and it's basically a free ticket to grad school. It is three years of funding, fully paid. It's wherever you want to go, NSF fully funded. Yeah. NSF fully funded. Uh, and that's like, you know, I felt like I won the lottery. I remember when I found out because I thought I had no chance. Um, and he said, well, go, you know, you can apply it to any program. He said, well, you know, apply to a PhD program. And I was like, have you lost your mind? Like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not that kind of, I'm not that nerdy. Like, I'm a little nerdy, but like, please, I'm not. And he's like, well, just go, just go check it out. And even if you don't like it after the first year, you, you get a free master's. And I was like, huh, I like the way you're thinking about this. So I, <laughs> so I went, um, I applied to a bunch of different schools again and Northwestern. I just loved the people and um, being in Chicago was, was a super rad thing. Um, and the same thing popped up in that they had a really close relationship with the Kellogg school of management. Um, and so I wanted to keep Got blending it. that engineering business line. Um, yeah. And so I ended up going there, found a professor I really, really liked in my first year. Um, and every year I would go through and be like, I think I want to keep doing this. Uh, and so I did. And, and, soon enough, I put in enough time. So, you know, three and a half years later, <laughs> had a wow. PhD and I was like, well, well, shit, now I really have to do this real life thing. <laughs> well, yeah. So, <laughs> so masters and then, then you become Dr. Sayuni. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you throw that around all the time, right? I don't think I've been called that since I walked out of the dissertation, but yeah, I maybe at a comp, I mean, I'm giving a couple of conference talks, but yeah. Okay. Well, we will, we will do that here from here on out. Uh, Perfect. And so uh, you, you, you get your doctorate. Uh, my most important question to you is in reference to something you said earlier, I get cold at 75. You're living in Chicago <laughs> right. for four years <laughs> or three and a half years, whatever it is. Um, what was that like? I mean, don't get me wrong. I, Chicago, my, one of my favorite cities in the world. Love it. Yeah. But I specifically go in the fall and the spring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is a fantastic place to visit. It's a fantastic place to live. Fantastic. There you go. I still have it. Uh, oh, Chicago. But, you got the Chicago. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Just a little bit <laughs> uh, for a handful of months out of the year. And the rest of it is is downright miserable. And there, uh, their engineering school is in this enormous building. Um, and so our office, obviously grad students, we didn't get nice offices. We, we got the interior of this office building. So there were days like I didn't see the sun. Um, and that's when I learned that sad or like the seasonal effect is, or it's a real thing. Yeah, yeah, I always thought yeah, people were just like whiny. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's a super real thing. And yeah. um, so I found, uh, you know, my handful of people who I found my people there um, and we just grinded it out. And I think that uh, being so cold, uh, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of interest on, on my side and going out all the time. So, uh, that's probably why I did it so quickly. Uh, what yeah. else was I going to do? Um, so I just grinded heard, through it. I've heard a number of our alumni who, who either go to Chicago for grad school, like yourself, or they go to work there and kind of their like young leadership, uh, executive rotational programs. Sure. Like, yeah. let's say it like, um, um, I think Baxter might be there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and a few others that are kind of in that Chicago land area. And they always tell me, um, oh my God, it's great because I get to kind of like turn on my social life and turn off my social life. Yeah. And like, like I get to basically like save money through the winter because I'm not doing a thing. And then you just go like all out, like you go out, you do this in the day, you do this yeah. at the night when like when everything starts warming up, there's this, this mentality of like, uh, we have a life and we don't have a life in, in, the, in the different seasons. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's definitely quite cozy uh, in the winter for sure. You spend a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time inside. When, when you're in Chicago, uh, did you live near Northwestern there? Like in Evans, it's Evansville, right? Is that right? Uh, yeah. Evanston, it's the first Evanston, town up, city. um, up the North shore. Uh, yeah. so I lived in town super close to campus. I think like a mile or something like that. Yeah, so I could yeah. walk when it was nice and ride a bike. Um, yeah. and that definitely in the winter, that was brutal. Um, but over there, one cool thing about Chicago, if you ever go, or if you're a football fan is, is the Notre Dame weekender is enormous there. And so I yeah. immediately funny thing, I, I moved to Chicago. I'm living in Evanston. I had been in the area like a week and I was running errands, you know, like going to bed, bath and beyond and target yeah. random stuff like that. Yeah. Try to set up my, my place. Um, and I had a car, uh, that I had bought with at graduation. So it didn't have a license plate on, but it had a USB a license plate frame on it. Right. Um, priorities, and I get, priorities. Yeah. Get, I get mean, the frame on, but not the, the license. first yeah. thing that goes on. Right. Um, and so I come out of my car and there's a note on the windshield 
and I opened it up and it's from a woman and her name is Caroline. And she said, Hey, um, not sure if you know about the USC alumni club in Chicago, we're like this, big, it is huge. And so they made it feel like home. So I immediately like emailed her. I, call, I, I don't even know if there was, yeah, there was email back then. I think I called her. There, there was uh, email then. I think I emailed her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel was really there- old. I don't, was was I using my carrier pigeon at the time? I don't, I don't I'm really pretty, remember. Look, it was a Hotmail account. Okay, that's how old I am. That's uh, all there was. It, yeah. it predated Gmail, right? So it did. So I emailed her from my Hotmail account <laughs> and she was lovely. And um, so I got connected with them. And that was super cool because we all got together every Saturday and watched football together. And then yeah. like there was, that club was huge and it spanned from like, I just graduated yesterday to like, I'm 113 years old and they all get together all the yep. time. And it was just, it was great. Um, so I, I found my more, little slice of USC in Chicago. That is, yeah. You found one of the biggest ones. That is one of the more hardcore alumni groups I've ever visited with. Um, Cause in, in my travels, we tend to, it, not so much anymore, but like I used to wherever city we were going to, cause we travel in the fall. Right. So there's games on Yeah. Yeah. And whatever city you're going to, the easiest thing to do was like find the alumni club and where they're watching the game, because it may yeah. not be available in my hotel room cable package or like whatever that right. is. Uh, or it's at like a really weird time. And so like you want to go to the place that like they've organized the game watch. And Chicago is almost the one where it was always consistently like a huge game watch. There's so many yeah. different people there. And you end up like running into people that you know, because so many people kind of go through Chicago, if that makes any sense. Like there's a part of yeah. their life that they live in Chicago. Um, yeah. and the, 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 the more senior members of that alumni club are <laughs> hardcore. Like yes. they, they were, everything they wear is Cardinal and gold, uh, which I'm like, it's a bit much, a bit much yeah. for me. There were a couple of, uh, there were a handful of couples there who were, uh, you know, older than my parents, let's say. Um, and they, they practically adopted me. Maybe like, are, are you good? Do you have Sunday supper? Like, do you want to go? And I was like, mm. what? <laughs> like, it's my first taste of Midwest hospitality too, I think. Um, That's great. But yeah. Yeah. It was good. That's but, really cool. yeah, but the, the Saturdays, I remember distinctly a gentleman, I went there um, and I dressed for the, for the game watch. Right. So I was wearing like yeah. my little Jersey and whatever. Yeah. And I get into the bar finally, and I'm just like practically dying from like the two block walk from wherever I had parked to get in. And he's yeah. like, Kristen, has nobody told you about Chicago? And I was like, well, what do you mean? It's my first winter, you know, my first, it was fall. It wasn't even winter. I mean, I think it had started snowing like that week. And he yeah. said, nobody cares what you look like. You just need to be warm. I was like, oh, that's not true. People do care what you look like. And it was this whole debate. He's like, where's your beanie? Where are your gloves? I was like, mess up my hair. <laughs> like, why do you mess um, this up? Yeah. Are, are How you much kidding? time this took? Yeah. I like, I, I need to show off my jersey. And so he's like, no, you don't. You need to not die of hypothermia. <laughs> so it was definitely awesome. a rough life adjustment. Life lessons. Life yeah. lessons. Life lessons learned at a football watch. Very cool. Now, you, your, your professional career, although starts with these internships, obviously, but yeah. then you go on to do a whole string of things with different yeah. companies. Um, where do you want to get started? You worked with, you worked at the Walt Disney Company. Yeah. So I, um, when I was in school, I studied, so industrial engineering is a lot at, at the graduate level is a lot of applied math. So mm. a lot of math optimization, statistics, like modeling and such. Um, so my research was actually, um, around supply chain and manufacturing optimization for, mm. um, at the time we called it closed loop supply chains. Um, so like, uh, sorry, before I get to Disney, I'll give you the, the primer, No, I actually, like, I realized I should have asked you, what was the dissertation? What were you focused on? So thank you for redirecting yeah. <laughs> my conversation. That's what we should have talked about first. No, I'm just like, I need to give you the primer. Closed uh, loop supply chain, yeah. Closed loop supply chain. And so um, now we are very, well, I wouldn't say we are very, but the U.S. is a little more environmentally minded than we used to be. Um, mm. But, you know, supply chains were originally set up like you mine a bunch of raw materials and then you make sub assemblies and then you manufacture something and then you ship it to the end customer and then we're done. And like, no, 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 that, that product has a whole useful life after the end of its like its first life. Right. So what do you do with products at the end of their first useful life? Like that supply chain was designed to go one direction. It turns out it's not so good at collecting stuff and de mm. and like a reduce, reuse, recycle and all that such. Yeah. So, so that's what my research looked at is how do you optimize um, supply chain network design and manufacturing processes to be cost efficient in both directions. 
And the field was relatively new. It started in Europe, um, but the in Europe, it's more legislation driven, right? Like you have yeah. to recycle your white goods. Right. You have to recycle all these things. Um, and in, and we took the perspective of like, well, that that model or the the optimization part of that model works really well when the customer is participating in the process. But in the U.S., that's optional. So how right. do you incentivize the customer to participate, right? right. So um, there are a lot of things in your home that have a lot of useful life in them still that just sit in a drawer or we're done with them. Uh, modern tech devices are a great example. Like there's a lot of valuable material in there. Um, but also we don't want that all to go to landfill. So I looked at that right. and it turns out it's just applied math. It's this um, niche field called operations research. And so gra when I graduated, I looked at being a professor and um, the only options were in even colder places. So I passed. Um, but I met these guys at, at Disney in the OR group and the OR group at Walt Disney World was, uh, I think, a, like a handful, five of us. Um, and it turns out the Walt Disney World has really hard math problems to solve. Uh, if this is Orlando, it, Florida. Yeah. So Walt Disney Florida, World, the, the actual theme parks. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. Okay. So the division was Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. Um, so we had Cruise Line and Adventures yeah. by Disney as well. But it's 50 square miles of property. There were at the time, uh, you know, 28 hotels, uh, four major theme parks, two water parks, yeah. restaurants, right? So if you think yeah. about the logistics of doing laundry for that many people, or really what time should the parks be open? How many shows should there be? Uh, one of the projects I looked at was just like you have to do preventive maintenance on your car, you have to do preventive maintenance on the, on the ride vehicles. Right. Um, right. So, and some of those are short, like an oil change, like, you know, one day service, some of them are like a major tear up because those, those vehicles ride hard all day. So yeah. if we only have a fleet of so many, like, how do we schedule them to optimize the life in between when they're running versus when they go down for maintenance, but also like, you don't want to take a whole bunch of cars off into major tear ups in the summer when it's peak hours, because then wait times go through the roof. Right. So there's all these really interesting um, back of house operations that happen there. Um, how do you schedule all the buses to pick people up and drop them off? We had 1200 right. Uh, right. drivers, right? So we did like their their union bids. And so, and then I got to work on some super cool, like here's a concept for a new park. How would we lay it out? Um, that park uh, never came to be, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> there's a, there's, I learned early on that I think it's super valuable. Like, especially when I went into consulting, you might do a whole lot of work that ends up in the trash can, but you learn something from it and you shouldn't feel sure. bad about that. So, uh, sure. so anyway, yeah. So I went to Disney and I did that for a couple of years, worked in their, um, industrial engineering group within, they have a very small, like a uh, bunch of math nerd mm -hmm. PhD clusters, uh, doing the real hardcore nerd stuff. Um, so I did that for a couple of years and then I went back to Chicago. Um, I decided that uh, I wanted to get a flavor of something else. Like I really liked yeah. it, um, but yeah. it just, I wanted another challenge. And um, so yeah. I went and worked for McKinsey and Company, which is a consulting firm yeah. um, and their operations group. Specifically, I worked on supply chain and manufacturing. Um, so I went back to Chicago, if you could believe that. But, uh, but this time, not as a student, it was so much more fun. Yeah. It was so much more fun to have a lot more money. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> Uh, yeah, Change, it changes your lifestyle a little bit to be a, a successful young professional in Chicago than a struggling grad student. Yeah, totally. It's a very different experience. And I did the lived in the downtown high rise and did all that, uh, all that fun stuff. Were, when you were in Chicago for McKinsey, were you always working in Chicago or were you working with uh, clients that were in different locations or because consulting is, is, you know, such a round robin type yeah. environment. Sometimes you stay with the same company all the time. Sometimes you're moving from project to project. Yeah. Uh, I, since I was in manufacturing supply chain, I got to work on really glamorous, glamorous projects, Ooh. like, um, like manufacturing chocolate and like toilet mm. paper and stuff. Like it, it At was the same time, <laughs> you know, they are <laughs> life does come full circle. Uh, so, um, so I was in Jersey for a little bit. I actually had a trip down to Atlanta, which or a stint down in Atlanta. Um, huh. but both winters I was there and I, I really must have pissed off somebody in the staffing group because they sent me to Wisconsin for both winters that I was there. And I was like, is it life could not get more cold? Like who, like, who do I have to pay around here to get a better assignment? Uh, so I was in, <laughs> it was 
terrible. Uh, well, I, it was fun, but it was really, really cold. Um, yeah. So, but that's where, that's where manufacturing is. So, so Got it. off, off we go to, uh, to Wisconsin. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So, uh, that was really cool to see different industries, uh, yeah. and see how a lot of what I had learned in theory, uh, was being applied, um, very practically in the end. I think the tension between theoretically what you should do <laughs> yeah. and then the implementation side of it. That's awesome. I want to, I want to skip back a little bit to, to yeah. Disney. Um, we, we have so many students that naturally come to engineering because they're like, I want to work at Disney or I want to work at a theme park. And, and yeah. there's so many variations of this electrical engineers, computer scientists, industrial yeah. systems engineers. And it's like, I want to do ride design. I want to, I just want to be there. I don't care what I do. You know, like that type of like Disney file um, yeah. nonstop. Is there anything that you can reflect on? And again, I know there's certain things sometimes you can't talk about, especially when we get into current your current position, which we haven't touched on yeah. yet. Um, but this, is there anything that you can reflect on that you're like, you feel really proud about or, or that you're able to say like, oh, I was there for that. Like, like you were there for the, the routing things at UPS. Is there anything at Disney that you were there or are you able to talk about the things that didn't come to fruition? I don't know if you can't or not. Uh, and you can I just say, no, I don't, I'm think fine. I, I don't think I can, but, uh, um, okay, that's fine. Don't worry about no, it. No, But I'm trying to think of what was the cool, what was super rad. Um, are you a big Disney person in general? Like, who, or is that uh, no, uh, no. I, I mean, I grew up in LA, right. So we went to Disneyland several times a year. Um, so I, I, but I, I thought it, it was one of those iconic brands, at least for me at the time, I don't think they've actually had any scandal, but, uh, you know, it was one of those like big, huge recognizable. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I found yeah. myself like building this, like, if I look at my resume, I was like, well, I've got some big names on here, right? I had yeah, you do. I had Motorola, yeah. I had Disney. And so I, so I, then I felt this pressure, like keep that up. Um, so one of the things that we did on that property actually tied back to what I did at UPS, which is we automated the bus routing um, at Disney property. Uh, and so. Um, and for the people among, that don't know that haven't been to Disney World, there's like all these hotels and all these theme parks and they have this really intricate bus system that yeah. like basically you can't really walk from place to place in the resort. No. There's sometimes there's like waterways to connect via like, I forget what they call them, but these yeah. little water trams, but the yeah. bus system. Um, I went to Disney world once in my life and it was around the same time, actually. Um, and I was just amazed that like, you just go outside and within like three minutes, a bus, wherever you want to go is on its way. And you just hop on yeah. and you're there. Yeah. So yeah, you're exactly right. Um, let me, I'll explain it a little better. There's, there's, I don't, I, I want to say there were 28 hotels at the time, um, with the four major theme parks, the two water parks, there's downtown Disney, which is like a shopping center. Um, yeah. and it's 50 square miles. So you're right. Like you can't get around and nobody is trying to walk anywhere in July no. in Orlando, Florida. It's no. disgusting. So, um, so we had at any given time, like 300 buses on property that were wow. just that are roaming around trying to take you wherever you want to go. There's a couple of places you could take a monorail, which is really fun. Or like mm -hmm. you said, the mm -hmm. water taxis. Um, but like you don't want them running on a, on a constant route. Right. Because if you think about the customer, like where people want to go, like the demand, right. Mm -hmm. Between, uh, if I go to my nerd vocabulary, we call it origin destination pairs. Right. Um, okay. like people want to go from the hotel to the theme park in the morning and generally from the theme parks back to the hotel at night, three in the afternoon, maybe they want, maybe you'll get a handful and want to go use the pool and such, but you know, four in the afternoon nobody's trying to go very many places as soon as the fireworks are done everyone and their mom is trying to get back to their hotel right so you right. have these like huge peaks in demand um and we don't want people standing around waiting for 20 30 minutes um so what we did Deter is determine sorry to interrupt determining origin destination data like that is that trial and error or are you just gathering that for a period of time as far as like when you see people happy versus unhappy yeah. So, so the, the origin destination pairs are, are defined just by anywhere in the network, any, anywhere on property, we would have an option to take a bus to and from, but Got the it. demand you're saying of like watching those patterns of like how many people throughout the day. Right. So yeah. we, we would see these huge peaks of like, whatever, I, I don't remember the numbers very accurately, but like, let's say it's like yeah. 50 people an hour or 50 people every 20 minutes from here to here, from this uh -huh. hotel to the magic kingdom. Yeah. Um, you know, at 10 a.m., that would go down. Maybe instead of 50 people every 20 minutes, it goes down to like 35. And then when you get to noon, it goes down to like 20. And then, it, it. you know, it picks back up throughout the day. 
so yeah, that was massive data collection. So we had people, we did it old school style at the beginning, like, you know, bus, bus drivers can keep tallies, right? Counting, Just yeah. Like you might see, yeah, like the guy with the clicker at Costco, right? Like yeah, uh, yeah. clicking. Um, but then over time, we got really sophisticated and we had like little um, readers. So anytime mm. you walk through a turnstile at Disney World, there's a little, it's invisible laser beam that like you cut yeah. and it keeps account, right? And that yeah. all feeds back into a database. So we were able to get automated data over a period of a couple of years and then build in this enormous <laughs> math problem of how do you then optimize how frequently each of those routes run. Um, so if you're in a low demand period, the bus will come less frequently. If you're in a really high demand period, it'll come every two minutes because the bus only holds 50 people. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, so you need more buses if it's higher. Um, and then we did, th there were a couple phases of the project. One is can you implement some routing that's sort of like, like your master routing essentially of like, this yeah. is the plan we're going to run at the beginning of the day. Here's where it gets really crazy. Well, in Florida, there's all kinds of weather patterns. So oh. another thing could happen is like a wicked thunderstorm could happen at like two in the afternoon. All of a sudden, a lot of people want to leave. They got to go to their hotel. They, they got to go. And if it's a five minute storm, which happens in Florida, they'll wait uh -huh. it out. If it's going to be a three hour thing, like those buses better, you know, all of a sudden the demand totally looks different. So we could feed in, uh, they actually have a really advanced weather uh, monitoring system in one of the control, uh, one of the control buildings. So we would know, um, in fact, a friend of mine, we were in there one day just talking to the guys and they said, Hey ladies, uh, are you here for the rest of the afternoon? Or are you we're like, no, no, we're going back to our, our office because we had to drive everywhere. Yeah. And they're like, you have about three minutes to make it out to your car. Otherwise oh you're going to be here for, for four hours. You're like, see you later. Right. We ran. <laughs> um, because we were at the Magic Kingdom and our office is at the animation studio. So uh, we oh had my to, God. yeah, we had to drive to all of our meetings and such. Cool. The, so th there's, I, I, th there's an often like really like loose example that I give students about industrial systems engineering is that because no one knows what it is, like, especially from high school it's terrible. And, and they're like, yeah. what is it? And we spend so much time talking about it on this podcast and also just in general when I'm talking to students. And one of the lines I traditionally give is like, you are immersed in industrial and systems engineering solutions every day, all day. But the issue is that when it's good, you don't notice it. Mm. And Disney in general is Disney, UPS, FedEx, like they're, they're all amazing at it. And so, but you know, when it's bad and you know, you know, when <laughs> something right. has gone horribly <laughs> wrong and you probably stay away from either that business or that service or that environment. And sometimes they have to do with like concert facilities. Sometimes they have to do with, uh, Oh, Amazon has got to be Amazon. the best example of like, yeah. it's, it, um, uh, there's an, it, the informs is the name of the professional organization and their tagline is the science of better. So oh, like, cool. so when I say applied math, it's like queuing theory, like how long is yeah. the wait time for something like this? Or what's the optimal distribution pattern? So, um, you know, in UPS is all about setting those routes to optimize costs and such. Um, United Airlines has an enormous industrial engineering team, right? So if you think about setting up flight schedules and crew scheduling yeah. is actually um, one of these traditional topics that's in the literature of like, how do you optimize crew scheduling? Because I don't know about you, I've been on plenty of planes where I got weather delayed out of Chicago or out of Newark, uh, yeah, you know, and yeah. the crew time's out. Well, now yeah. you have to go get another fresh crew, but can they make it like the six hours if I'm flying back from Newark back to SFO? And like that, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, it, it's a lot of math in the background it's all to behind get it right. The scenes. Yeah, it's all behind yeah. the scenes and, it, and no one ever notices it until it goes wrong. Yeah, they're, they're undercover. And then there's a whole branch of it that's uh, program management, which is, is the branch I work in now. Um, but all about like, how do you manage that sort of stuff? So I, I remodeled my house and the contractor, I was, I think I was simultaneously the biggest pain in the ass for him. And also the most well-prepared person he had ever worked with. Cause I was like, here's right. the order we're going to do things in this material's coming on this day. But like, like I had it like my Gantt yeah. charts and everything. And, oh, wow. um, I think it was the most managed he had ever been in his life. So I, I think he, he, he appreciated it a little bit. Um, retrospectively, then, I'm confident he did. He's like, he's like, what did that lady have me do? I'm going to do that this next house, even though he, she, he hated it at the time. Yeah. He, he did not like me being all up in his, in his business um, at the time, but <laughs> at the end of, of our work together, he said, Hey, if you know, the whole Apple thing doesn't work out for you, like, would you want to come work for me and like be the face to my clients so that help them get their shit in order. So I don't yeah. have downtime. And yeah. I was like, 
Now there's a pretty nice side hustle to be. That's had. a side hustle. That is a, <laughs> yeah. that's a side hustle. That's not uh, I'll construction to, consultant. I'll, I'll, I'll exponentially increase your side hustle here for a minute. That's not just a side hustle. That's a side hustle that becomes an HGTV show. Ooh, yes. That yes. that's you. That's you. That's where like I you like start that. that for the purposes of getting to the on-camera gig because that niche, I don't think exists in any of these design shows. There's all this like this design show, that design show, this reno show, that whatever. Because by the way, my household is obsessed with these from a six-year-old <laughs> all the way up. We all watch it. them um, to the point that like she starts drawing things and redesigning her room. And like, oh, like, I, like at one point I'm like, <laughs> that's hilarious. And that point I'm like, that's really impressive. And I want to keep pushing yeah. you down this road. Foster that, yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. It's a whole other side combo about like identifying little things in her. I'm like, perfect. Keep doing that. <laughs> like, keep going that direction. <laughs> Life will uh, be so much easier if you get really good at that. Yeah. yeah get really good at that. And I'm going to show you math. That's going to help you with that in the, in the near future. Um, but this, this idea of, um, that's you, that's, that's that concept that doesn't exist. We got to mark this conversation right now as like, this is the beginning of your third, right. fourth, fifth chapter, whatever you're going for on like renos and efficiency, ren efficiency. We're going to call it right that right there. We named it. Write it down. Um, I'm telling you, so we haven't talked about where I am now, but I, I work up in the Bay at Apple and we're so design oriented. And so every, like we have our own internally, our own secret list of contractors who we're willing to work with. Oh. People up here, you know, housing's yeah. older, we make a lot of yeah, money, yeah. we renovate all the time. You mean um, internally for your own homes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have like, like a little list. You're like, these. Are, this is the good like, list. And these like are Apple, appro- the Apple employee list, approved. But, but, but only for us, right? Because Ooh. we are we cannot handle inefficiency. We will pay to expedite things. Like, like it, yeah. it's like, we're not constrained in that. And, and that's just the way we run Apple, right? Is like time is money and we got a yeah. whole lot of money and not a lot of time. So like yeah. figure that shit out. Right. Like, like, I don't understand. It's not here. Well, can we just call so like, like just next level expediting processes. Um, but then you combine that with the design, um, intolerance for bad design uh you know and i remember coming and like he laid out the tile in my shower and i was like oh we're we're gonna redo that right and he's like what do you mean i was like well do you see how this just doesn't like that that that's not work that you're proud of is it like it doesn't align and he's just is this the best you can do I'm, is this I'm, the best you is this, this marble is vein try, is this right? marble vein the best that was available at the granite at the, at the granite shop i mean i think there was probably better i'm just gonna assume yeah like the guy who did all my countertops, they have bought the three, I bought all the slabs and he, and I measured it Which, all by out the way, him. in the back of my mind, before we ever started talking about this, I'm glad we are. I wanted to talk about your kitchen that I'm looking oh, at right now, because it is gorgeous and oh, it is you. deserving of any HG TV show that we can make. Uh, oh, and if you. you were a part of that, then it makes complete sense. Yeah. I, uh, I bought a total dump and touched every single surface in the house. Um, yeah. Every, every single surface. Uh, but like the, the guy who was doing my countertops is like, Oh, we need three slabs. And I was like, no, we don't, we only need two. And he's like, well, no, but we need three. And I was like, let me show you. And so I made like a chart and I, I plotted it out just like I would like a CAD design. Right. And I was like, or it was like 2d. Right. But, and I said, yeah, see how we're going to, and we have these kinds yeah, I was like, how much, way, cut that yeah, way. Like, and then, and then we want this much overhang and how much clearance do you need for the saw? And right. And I mapped it out from, he's like, Oh yeah, you're right. And I was like, see, it's not that hard, but like, <laughs> my parents have been like okay three slabs you know or or yeah. anybody else and i was like no, sir i'm gonna optimize this for you like, sir have we discussed your your, <laughs> your waste management in, 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 right? in, 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 that you've been you've been encumbering in your costs here <laughs> sir i don't know what games you're trying to play like if you just <laughs> suck at this or if you're trying to use that slide for yourself but no we don't need. Let, me, let me talk let me talk to you about cost optimization <laughs> and and kind of figuring out like what your costs are your up market to the client and then the totally. ability to reduce waste because that's what totally. we need to really discuss because if you were buying three slabs you could buy two mark up by 30 percent, make a lot more money on this and you'd be fine oh i'm telling you and it, it was just, you know you're on to something with this show because when i negotiated the contract i was like all right, well, your materials, but like, I'll give you this much for labor. Like when I, I had yeah. the guy come out into the yard and I was like, okay, but this is your cost and you need six guys for this amount of time. And like, sh- I'll give you some inefficiency factor. Of, and like the whole, like I built up my, my bottoms up cost model. And I was like, this feels like a fair price to me. 
he was just like, holy shit. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm dead serious. If and when you want to, you contact me. I'm going to executive produce this thing because I want to be in on this. I, I, I could see I could see it. I could be behind the scenes. We can get your persona going because you have it. You, you have that persona. You're ready to <laughs> go. You. And we will shape the show. We'll create the narratives because that's what I'm there good at. Go. We'll, we'll have we'll have a good time. This is going to be I'm, I'm excited for this. I love it. Uh, this could be my ne- my next uh, foray. So, so b- before we get too far ahead in our lives, uh, yeah. you go to Apple. And, and yeah. I know that the minute the minute an Apple employee starts talking about working at Apple, there are so many layers to this. So yeah, if you ever if you ever trip over something that you're not supposed to talk about, tell me and I'll remove it. But you sure. you, you just go. Yeah. OK, <laughs> I, I'm pretty well versed in it. I did not get permission from anybody to talk about it. So this podcast is about me as a person. I just happen to work at this super secretive place. But um, yeah, I came to Apple. So I was working at McKinsey. Um, I decided I didn't want to be like those guys when I grow up and I was cold. Um, And I just wanted to come home to California. I had been gone for, I think it was eight years or something at that point. So um, the really amazing thing about working for a consulting company is like you're a potential client when you leave. So they treat you really well when you leave and you have Mm. access to this enormous alumni network that just posts all these jobs. Um, Mm. So I went to this job, internal job site um, and I filtered for California and I was just like, Ooh, I talked to the guys at Mattel. I talked to the guys at HP was around back then. Can you believe it? I talked to Google. Mm-hmm. I talked, right. Like, so I just, here's the list of jobs in California and then filtered for ones that I thought I'd be interested in. Um, and I came across one posted by a McKinsey alum, um, to go work at Apple and it was 2011. Um, and at the time I had an iPhone and an iPod. Um, I think there were two apps on my iPhone. Um, so I, I'm not like, I'm not a not, user of our stuff, right? right? But I just know how to make it. So I was talking to him. He's this really is the cool. trend with, with, with Disney. Like, I, I'm aware of Disneyland, <laughs> but I'll cool. work for you. Like, oh, I, cool. I'm aware what of these got, things called, right? called iPhones, but yes, yeah, tell like, me. Like I have one, my mom gave me one. So, uh, so we were talking and he didn't have a role defined, uh, but he knew having come from McKinsey, he wanted a McKinsey person to work on his team. So he had just put this feeler out there and it was to work in our, um, in our manufacturing design team, uh, making glass, glass, the, the cover glass that you touch for iPad at the time it was iPad, but iMac, uh, trackpad glass, all kinds of stuff, right? Every, anything except for iPhone at the time was, was in our team. Got it. Um, and it was him and one other guy. And he's like, we need a third person. Cause at the time we were so much smaller. Now I think nine people do the job I used to do because the volume has just grown so much. And um, so I was talking with him, really cool guy, liked him, thought it was good. He's like, okay, cool. And then um, the earthquake hit in Japan and he went radio silent on me for like two weeks. And I was, and, but this I didn't Fukushima? connect the dots. Is- yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like the, the, right. There was a tsunami with the nuclear. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so a it turns, thing. It turns out they were like right there when it happened. And so they oh. had to emergency evacuate out of Japan. We have, there may or may not have been a supplier there. Uh, so, so they were visiting the supplier. Right. Uh, and, and they got emergency evacuated, cut off all this kind of jazz. So he, he was kind of quiet for a while. And I thought like, Oh, I guess he's just not that into me, right? Like, oh, yeah, continue yeah, with the yeah. other. And so I texted him one day and I was like, yo, I'm going to be out talking to Google next week. Are you around? Like, you want to have a coffee? Because we were slow rolling it. It was very, it's very casual. Uh, you I, like know, job job dating. Throwing, I like all the dating terms you're throwing around in your job d- description. Like, yeah, I don't know if he was really into me. Well, we were slow rolling it. We were, we, were coffee. Just, we were having yeah. coffee, right? So I said, hey, I'm going to be out there because I was living in Chicago at the time. Uh, you have, do you have time for coffee? And he's like, yeah, why don't you come by? I was like, cool. I'm at Google Friday. I'm flying back home Saturday. So I'll just come Friday at the end of the day. He's like, yeah, that works. So I roll into Apple wearing like my business suit because I was a consultant at the time and right. I almost got laughed out of the room. The first person he sits me down with is the vice president of manufacturing, uh, who to this day, I adore. Like he is just one of one of the kind, like, he's just a kind soul. Um, and he took me under his wing eventually, you know, now he's, he's a great mentor, but I didn't know anything about him. He sits me down. He's like, why are you dressed like that? Like that was literally in the first 30 seconds. And I was like, well, it turns out like, I'm just here to have coffee, like very naive. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, di- yeah. I didn't know how important he was or that he was like four levels above the role I was interviewing for. Um, and he, you know, just sort of sits back and does one of these, like, well, what's your interest in Apple? 
well, shit, man. I don't know. I just came to have coffee. I with just came to have coffee with my buddy. I, right. Yeah, what, like, what am, what am I, I here like, for? What's happening? Well, it turns out the guy who hired me didn't have an approved rec for the role. So he wanted me to just like, I was, but his thought was, I'll just charm these guys. They'll see how smart I am. They'll see, you know, and, and then they will <laughs> give him a rec to hire me. That was his thought process. He copped to it later. So I'm talking to this like very senior guy. And he's just like, mm, you know, uh, why are you dressed like that? And I was like, well, I was interviewing at Google. And, and then he's like, well, what, what do you know about Apple? I was like, mm, not much. <laughs> well, do you know anything about us? And I was like, I know a guy who works in the retail store. And he's like, that's not the same. And I was like, okay. I was like, he's like, well, tell me about you. So I said, well, I like to work on impossible problems that have never been solved before. You know, got this PhD, worked on this branch of research. I worked on these really hard problems at Disney. Um, you know, I went to McKinsey thinking like, I'm going to learn a whole bunch of stuff. And it turns out I spent a lot of time teaching what for me were basic concepts to people who didn't, who, who weren't as skilled as I was or as educated as I was to execute them. And I'm, I'm kind of bored. And like, I just want to work on really hard things. And I just want to work with cool people, you know, like I, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. So I work about people like, you know, you get that intellectual stimulation going. Um, I was like, I work really, really hard. I've got that, you know, my, um, I have that immigrant hustle from my parents, right? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm a self-starter. I work really hard. I do all these things. And, and it's like, but mostly I just, I just really want to enjoy what I'm doing. And, well, and he, he just kind of sits back and he like, he stares, he stares me down for a good, like seven, eight seconds. He's like, you belong here. And I was like, cool. I'm glad you think so. So what you got, right? Like it was, yeah. I was very conversational with him because at that point in my career, I realized, um, I'm going to toss another dating term at you we both have to swipe right on each other. This isn't about me selling myself. This isn't about me proving I'm good enough for you. This is like, are you the kind of person I want to work with? Yeah. And that's how I approach my Mutual. team now. Mutual, this is how yeah. I approach every interview with every can, every candidate I ever interview. I said, this is as much about you swiping right on us as, as, as on you. Like mm -hmm. our ultimate goal is to, is to find the right environment and the right people where we can do our life's best work. And yeah. this might not be the right match, but if it is, some real awesome shit's going to happen, right? This is going to be incredible. And so I took that approach, um, I think starting when I left McKinsey of like, I'm just going to find what works for me. Um, and, and it, it, it worked. He, you know, um, I, he, the, at the end of our conversation, he walked out of the room and he, I think he thinks he's a quieter man than he is. Um, he's actually, he's actually quite loud. So I heard him just lean in. He's like, I don't know why we're having anybody else talk to her, just hire her. Like how soon can she start? <laughs> was, you know, so. How cool uh, is that? Yeah. And it turns out he's just, he's been a dear friend and, and sort of a godfather for my career here for the last 10 years. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. I feel like Ten I'm talking too much about it, but yeah. No. So I was in, I was in manufacturing design, um, yeah. working on glass. I learned all about glass, got on a plane to China two weeks after I started. I'd never been to China before. Um, I traveled to China a lot the first couple of years. And then, um, I, I'm the kind of person, like I get bored really easily. Like I want to move on to the next thing. And so I've been in that gig for a couple of years and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go check out something else within yeah. Apple. I don't know what. Um, and at the time we were bringing up us manufacturing for the Mac pro down in Austin. So mm -hmm. I could talk about that now. Uh, mm -hmm. the Brown, uh, the black round shiny one. Um, yeah. and so we took a greenfield site. It was literally an empty warehouse and we filled it with a bunch of RCNCs and, anodizing lines and buffing lines and blasting lines and all. Um, and they needed a team to go down there and work it. And the crazy thing about us is like, we hadn't manufactured in the U S in a really, really long time um, as a company. Right. And the really amazing thing about China is like, you can build factories in a couple months. You can yeah. easily go hire 50,000 people to go work yeah. the lines. Like the, the pace and the scale right. is, is just to say orders of magnitude would be a gross understatement. So figuring out how to do that in, in good old Texas <laughs> turned out like that was actually really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so me and a bunch of, a bunch of guys I worked with went down there. Uh, we lived there for eight months, uh, worked day in, day out. That factory ran 24 seven. So I, um, I didn't have any all nighters at USC or in grad school. I had all nighters in that factory for the first time in my life, wow. uh, just trying to make that part as perfect as we could. So anyway, so he sent me to Texas for eight months and then I came back. Um, and in that eight months I was gone, like all the other, you know, I had been backfilled in my other role. And so I said, well, now what do you want me to do? Um, 
And he said, you know, like you did that environmental stuff when you were in grad school. I was like, yeah, sure did. The closed loop supply chain. Yeah, yeah, you did that environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the stuff you did. And he's like, and and you were in consulting, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, so you know how to like sort of figure out nebulous things? I was like, I mean, I know a thing or two. He's like, cool. Apple had just hired Lisa Jackson a handful of months prior. She had been, she's the VP of environmental and social initiatives now. But she Mm -hmm. had just been hired. She used to run the EPA under President Obama. She came to Apple and she said, uh, we're going to reduce our corporate carbon footprint. And we're going to start with manufacturing aluminum. And she gave him this directive of like, you don't even want to know how much aluminum we (laughs) we consume. It's like, it it is hurts my soul to look at it because of it, just all the way the inefficiency in the process right, and because right. of the the high grade that we use requires like ex- anyway um and so he's like can you go figure out how we would do that all right so but you know figure it out like we've, how- we've got a claim we need to make it happen in reality yeah. you're the reality maker yeah so it's like really like this really cool opportunity to like scope the size of the problem to use yeah. the consulting term and like again going back to when you were three years old like reduce reuse recycle like can we use recycled content? We, we typically don't because of the quality, the cosmetic requirements right. that we have. When you right. use recycled aluminum, you get black strains, you get weird grain mm. structures. Mm. Like it, it, everybody thought it was impossible. It's like, well, we're going to figure it out. And now we're about to make claims and some product lines we've already made claims. Like we use hundred percent recycled content. Like that's incredible progress Huge. to make in four years five years yeah. right yeah um to and still deliver on the cosmetics that we deliver on for the design team right um but can you reduce it so instead of you know we we were the kings of the unibody portable back then right which is literally you yeah. take a block of metal and you see and see the heck out of it right. but when you do that your utilization of the material is like really quite small which means the rest of it is all um cnc chips that end up not being useful, but mm-hmm. are hugely valuable environmentally, financially, and such, right? So can we start stamping or, um, you know, forming? Can we try different forming opportunities? Yeah. Um, so anyway, there was like this really cool opportunity. So I, I got to do that for about six months. Um, and then um, that project was sort of scoped. And now it's like, okay, now let's go implement it throughout the company. And then it goes back to the product team. So I went back to my mode of like, well, now what am I going to do? Right. So I, I had all that problem moving on. Yeah. What, what else we got? So, um, so I had a bunch of coffee chests, uh, but I called up a guy who was a good friend of mine who um, was running the product design team for iPad. Um, and I was just like, you know, I'm thinking about leaving or like maybe internally, like, I don't know what I should do. And so this is all over text. And he's like, well, come by. So I was like, what, like right now? He's like, yeah, like right now. So it's like, all right. So, you know, leave my desk and make it look like I was at a meeting. And I walked over and we had this impromptu two hour conversation. And he's like, look, you understand manufacturing, you know, about glass, which it turns out is really hard to do. Um, we had just started an iPad doing full lamination on our displays, which it turns mm-hmm. out is really, really hard to do. Um, he's like, I need somebody who speaks all of those languages, who can talk to the design team, who can talk to manufacturing, who can talk to our system integration team right. and just make it work better. All right. So, yeah. you know, so I learned all about displays, which I didn't know anything about. Um, and so I was in product design for a couple of years and um, fast forward. And then um, uh, the gentleman we had leading program management for iPad left Apple. And so they, they were like, Hey, come do, come do this. And I was like, no, no, I think I'm cool. Like, I, I still want to do this display thing. They're like, mm, come do this. So, so then I picked up program management for iPad. Um, and eventually my team has grown to include iPad, Mac. So all the desktops and portables and input devices. So keyboards, mice, et cetera. Um, and then all the thermal, I now have responsibility for the thermal modules that go into all those devices, uh, wow. which I, I, I didn't know anything about thermals before. So, uh, so I guess the lesson is just learn it on the job. It's kind of cool. Thank you so much, Paul. I was wondering, like, is can you tease a little bit what's going to happen in the next episode? Because I haven't listened to it either. So I'm kind of excited. The next episode is a lot about Apple. 
uh, and probably more than she should be talking about with Apple. Um, I mean, there's a lot of like secrets with Apple, but I guess she has certain clearances, but she talks a lot about working at Apple, the culture at Apple, the importance of company culture when people are looking at jobs, what they find important, the importance. Uh, we get into a, a really deep self-care conversation um, that maybe I was just on a certain mood that day and, and maybe just aligned with her, but some really cool stuff that's coming up next week. If you're just kind of, if you're one of those persons that, that, that is always thinking about how to improve yourself and uh, how to take care of yourself, the importance of wellness, not only from just like an academic standpoint and the daily standpoint, but also the relationship of wellness and your job. I think people overuse this term work-life balance, but this, uh, this concept of like, what am I doing for myself? How am I communicating that to my superiors? How am I communicating that to my team, to my, to my the people that work for me, that report to me? Um, and, and some interesting tidbits about stuff that she does and a side hustle that she does that I had no idea. A uh, keyword oh. is hustle. I don't want to tease it too much, but the keyword is hustle. Oh my gosh. Um, and I was like, what? No way. That's crazy. Um, so there's some, some really cool stuff that comes up and we get it. We get a little uh, introspective. We get a little introspective and in, in talking yeah. about meditation and yoga and some other stuff. It's a, uh, it, it's a really interesting conversation. Oh, wow. I like was not expecting that. That's exciting. Yeah. I, I, and again, I don't remember exactly when it happened in the conversation, but it's, it's, it was cool. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Like I said, mm -hmm. I didn't cut it off because I was just totally digging the conversation uh, and, and connecting with her. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So uh, as Emily mentioned, part two will be out next week. So come back here uh, for part two, uh, the, the thrilling conclusion of the Kristen Sayuni interview. We have um, some more alumni coming up in, in the near future as well. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome to get to know these, these people because they all come from different backgrounds and different challenges and different ideas. And it's, uh, it's, it's cool, I think, to hear their, their journey, uh, especially as you our listener is, is the one listener that's out there is, is thinking about what you want to do. And, and I think that the thread that you hear in all of these conversations is you're not supposed to have it figured out, uh, even though you think you are supposed to have it figured out, you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully by hearing that from someone other than your parents is a good thing. And you can hear how this is just reality. Uh, and well, you can't just chalk it up to some sort of advice of like, oh, everything will work out where everything's supposed to happen the way it's supposed to happen. Uh, Cause that's frustrating. Uh, this gives you a little bit more of like how it does or how it will and steps that you need to take to be responsible for yourself. And, and, and I think everybody's going to find it helpful. Yeah. Honestly, the alumni interviews make me feel like more comfortable and that yeah. I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to do. Well, that's kind of the thing, right? So like high school students uh, in particular and college students at other institutions that are looking to transfer are usually in the state of like, um, uh, kind of dynamic stress. Like I don't, I'm worried nothing, the ground isn't settled under me and all I want it to do is be settled and I want to be solved and I want to like be where I want to be. And they think that going to college is where the ground gets settled. And I always <laughs> look at our currency and like, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And like, that, that's what they need to know. Mm -hmm. This idea that like, you know, you're, you're, you're still struggling with decisions, right? Yeah. I mean, I feel like for me, I'm lucky that like pre-med kind of like pushes that off, you know? Mm-hmm. I feel like I hear a lot now from my friends because I'm a senior and like it's like, oh, like I'm going to spend another year at USC. I'm going to do PDP like, yeah, I'm not ready to go. Like, I don't know exactly what I want to do. And I feel like medical school is kind of doing that, too. But mm -hmm. I all I do really love like the concept of going into medicine. But it is cool that like like Kristen just like did a Ph.D. And then she worked at Disney and like did all these things. I just think it was really cool listening to her story. Yeah, she's awesome. Uh, for all of you out there that are going through the admission process, as a reminder, the Common App is live and uh, accepting applications. We've already got a number of them. We started downloading them. Um, and so you can go to our website, viterbiadmission.usc.edu slash apply, um, or you can go to um, admission.usc.edu slash Common App uh, to start filling out the Common App. We've got a number of posts on our website about how to fill out the application. There's a video that will walk you through to make sure that you're listing one of the Viterbi School of Engineering majors. Uh, we got a recent post up there about our supplemental questions. You know, we have two extra questions on the application for engineering and computer science students. Sometimes people ask us questions about those things. So we put up a blog post about how to answer those questions. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, bottom line, we're not trying to mess you up. We're not trying to trick you up. There aren't trick questions. We're just trying to get to know you better. And the answer to everything is 
authentically, who are you? And that's really what you want to be asking yourself. And while I know that's challenging, the more you think about it as how do I represent myself to be myself? That's what you want to do in our application. So make sure you're doing that. If you haven't had a chance to, to check out one of our virtual information sessions, we're doing them every Tuesdays and Thursday at four o'clock. And you, and in addition to uh, Emily and her friends leading some student-led live chats on Sunday evenings, in addition to transfer information sessions on Friday afternoons and faculty roundtable sessions starting next week. Uh, so we've got so many virtual events, faculty sessions by department and major, student-led sessions on Sunday, transfer sessions on Friday, first-year info sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So many things. Go to viterbiadmission.usc.edu slash visit, or here's an easier one, viterbi.live slash events, viterbi.live slash events. You'll see every one of these events loaded up. And if you miss anyone, all of the recordings are posted there as well. Check it out. We can't wait to see you there in addition to our upcoming podcast episodes. But I think we've talked enough, right? Emily, <laughs> yeah, anything else? Yeah, I think else? that covers it. Okay. We'll see you all next week for part two. Thank you.